The World Health Organization Africa is about to brief the media on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and the rollout of vaccines. Let's take you live to that. Uh, bonjour and welcome to all the journalists and colleagues participating in this press conference today. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to be joined by Yvonne Chaka Chaka, the internationally renowned South African singer, humanitarian, philanthropist, health and rights advocate, and my dear sister as well, and by my colleague, uh, Madame Ulimata Saar, who is the regional director for UN Women in West and Central Africa, based in Dakar. As we look forward to celebrating International Women's Day next Monday, under the theme, Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. We'll discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected women in Africa. On, a, on the African continent, there have now been more than 3.9 million cases of COVID-19, and sadly, 104,000 people have died. Overall, the epidemic is still trending downwards in most countries on the continent after a second wave, but with pressures to ease restrictions, population fatigue in adhering to preventive measures, and the circulation of variants of concern, there is a real risk of cases increasing again in the future. In fact, we have seen an increasing trend in about 10 countries. Our analysis of 28 countries but of distribution by sex finds that on average, 41% of COVID-19 cases are women. Of course, this varies across countries. This lower burden among women is likely due to a range of factors, including the findings of several studies that women are more likely than men to adhere to measures to prevent COVID-19. Women have really stepped up to the challenge of this pandemic with courage and with compassion. They make up 70% of the global health workforce, and many women are on the front lines, especially as nurses and community health workers, and of course, primary caregivers in families at home. Women are showing impressive leadership in politics, and in the private sector. Heads of state, such as the New Zealand Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Jacinda Ardern, other heads of state who are women like the leader of Iceland's philanthropists like Toin Saraki, trailblazers like Dr. Awa Kolsek, and innovators like Dr. Ola Brown have mobilized strongly against COVID-19 and other priority health issues. Unpaid care and domestic work, almost always done by women, has increased with school closures and stay-at-home orders, as have several risks. A WHO analysis conducted in 22 African countries found a rise in maternal deaths in 10 of them, while nine reported a decline in births in health facilities and an increase in complications due to abortions. So COVID-19 is exacerbating inequities associated with gender in several key spheres of life and development. The work that many African women rely on for their livelihoods, for example, in areas such as personal care and in the informal sector, came to a standstill for several months in many countries due to the lockdowns. So at WHO, we are working with governments to ensure the continuous delivery of essential gender responsive services, and we're providing training for health workers to support women suffering, for example, from gender-based violence, about which I'm sure we'll hear more uh, from, my, from my fellow panelists. This is an area where work across sectors is crucial. Men and women and social and economic development will benefit from gender equality, and so we all need to invest in achieving it. Turning then to an update on access to vaccines, particularly through the COVAX facility. This week, Africa has been at the forefront of COVAX vaccine deliveries, finally, with almost 10 million vaccine doses being delivered to 11 countries as of this morning. We expect that around half of the African countries will receive COVAX deliveries in the coming week, and that most countries will have vaccination programs underway by the end of March. I'd like to appreciate His Excellency President Nana Akufa-Addo, the president of Ghana, from be, for being among the first people in Ghana to get vaccinated, 
thus encouraging his fellow citizens to come forward when it's their turn, and for his strong support in debunking misinformation and reiterating the importance of all public health measures to defeat COVID-19. So I'd like to thank you very much once again for joining us, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moeti, for those uh, beautiful words, and to again welcome to our distinguished guests today. Uh, so, uh, Ulimata Sar, could you please uh, tell us how COVID-19 has impacted uh, women and their livelihoods? Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, and uh, thank you, Dr. Moeti, and our good friend uh, uh, Yvonne Shaka Shaka. You know, um, the, the United Nations called the COVID pandemic um, impact on women the shadow pandemic. And I will focus on the, the, the economic side. We, had a, we, we did a study. Uh, we talked to 1,300 women-owned businesses. And when I say women-owned businesses, formal and informal, in all sectors, agriculture, trade, uh, tourism and hospitality, you name it. And the message is the same. We have lost the vast majority of our revenue. In those 30 countries, the women have said that the lockdowns, the restrictions of movement have affected their business greatly. Has affected their business greatly because they are really the most vulnerable. Uh, if you recall, uh, several studies have shown that the gender financing gap is huge. Uh, in in uh, Africa, you know, the figures are into 50, 60 billion dollars worth of gender financing gap. And today, we with the uh, UNDP have started since September something called the Global Gender Response Tracker. And we looked at um, 49 countries, what kind of measures do they have um, to, in response to the COVID-19 that are gender sensitive? And then we realized that the vast majority of stimulus packages, of responses, of recovery plans seems to very much focus on how to address issues of violence. 56% uh, address the issues of, of violence in some form. 40% of that address issues of economic uh, empowerment and economic uh, justice. And then we realized that some of them are still gender blind. I think a lot of countries, uh, when addressing the issues of, of social economic well-being of women, thought that the response was uh, food distribution, uh, was maybe some marginal cash transfers. And the women that we spoke to said, no, we are looking for capital. We are looking for patient capital to keep our businesses afloat. I think that's critical. Uh, Dr. Mueti mentioned earlier on the, the, the burden of, of, of care uh, that the women are carrying right now. And you will know that a lot of African countries don't, for, don't have an institutionalized um, way of social protection. And then women who are in the informal sector are falling through the cracks. I know several countries in my region that um, did give some stimulus checks, some stimulus packages, but if you look at the, the images on TV, those checks were given to very well organized um, business association and business groups, uh, most of them dominated by women, by, by men, I'm sorry. So it's very critical for us when we're looking at, at uh, building back better, that we address uh, the, the gender financing gap, that we make sure that measures that the governments are putting in place are not gender blind, and it's our role as partners, as the UN, to make sure that we engender our work. Otherwise, the women will continue to fall behind and left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, we are pleased to have uh, people like you to talk to us today in the wake of March when we celebrate the International Women's Day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Sar. And now we turn over to Yvonne Chaka Chaka, who we celebrate also as an immunization uh, ambassador, to please shed some light on what you've observed as the impact of COVID uh, on women, especially being in a country like uh, South Africa. Thank you to our capable MC, Dr. Filona. Is it Filo F Fiona? Fiona, it is. Uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. I always want to get uh, uh, people's names correctly. Thank you very much, Dr. Muyeti, for inviting me, you know, to speak today. Um, and greetings to our sister, uh, Madame Olimata. Uh, to all the journalists and panelists who are here today, here listening, I'm actually very honored, you know, to have this conversation ahead of the International Women's Day and speak about the pandemic's effect on women. Uh, this morning, I was talking to a dear friend and a sister, Sophie Mukwena from the SABC. We have lost one of our best journalists, a sister and a friend as well, Karima Brown. She died this morning because of COVID. So I really want to take just a minute to acknowledge the good work that this woman has done and say to her family, may her soul rest in peace. We have lost a champion. And um, just one minute silence for her, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. It's not, it's not very easy. You know, in the past, uh, we've seen COVID-19 has turned our lives and our family lives, our professional lives upside down. I know that too well, you know, and all I know is that our governments have implemented measures to control the, the pandemic. And while I see these, I see the talk about these things. We need to make sure that our women are not affected, but it's said that they are. The speakers before me have all issues that women go through and girls, the ex experiences that our children are going through as well. It's another thing that we have to look at. A girl child, we have to help now. I've listened to women share their personal experiences on how this pandemic has really affected them. I have a radio station called Woman Radio, and I hear women every day talking about these challenges. It is important that we stand for our rights, ladies and gentlemen. Women Radio is one of those platforms where topics which are considered to be taboo can finally be discussed, you know, especially for women. Women can speak now and tell us what their problems are, and we have to be listening. But with that said, I still think we need to bring our men. Once we as women understand ourselves and empowered ourselves, know our issues, it would be very easy to have men to advocate for a station that pushes to the fore and be part of us and advocate for us. I know the pandemic has resulted in many school closures around, around uh, Africa particularly, and girls are not going to school and what does that do to them these girls they fall i think we're having an issue there or because of the pandemic a girl not going to school are you having a, a can you hear me we can hear you now kindly go ahead Okay, I was saying, can you imagine a girl who has not been going to school? It becomes very difficult for a girl child to go back to school. So what does that happen? What does that, what happens next? These young people fall prey to these terrible people. They fall prey to these men and that results to unplanned pregnancies or sometimes exploitation. How do we make sure that doesn't, that doesn't happen? Gender-based violence is another thing. It has been a huge problem in Africa. I know only too well. When I was growing up as a young girl in Soweto, Jobsonville, I've seen women being raped. I've seen women being maimed. I've seen women being abused by those that are supposed to be protecting them, loving them and guarding them. What is this world coming to? How are we going to change this pandemic? I would like to see our governments taking gender-based violence seriously as they are taking this pandemic called COVID. We need to start having actions. Plans are there, policies are being put by those who are in power. We need the political will, but at the end of the day, we need action. We need to make sure that our women 
are not abused. Women have lost their work. Women are the ones who make sure that even in this pandemic, our husband, our children, our partners have got food to eat. But what happens at the end of the day? They are the ones who fall prey to all the bad people and the bad things. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to, to start fighting even more, not taking arms, but making sure that our women are not in the situation that they are in. You can imagine a woman who has lost her job or our people holistically. What does that do to your mental health? We then find so many people that their mental state is not correct because of this pandemic. So we need to make sure that we ask our governments to close all those gaps. We also need to have data. Once we have enough and sufficient data that tells us how many people have the pandemic, how many people have got help, that will then help us and actually guide us. Ladies and gentlemen, we can make this. We can and share their stories. The more the problems uh, are discussed openly and understood, when we as the public, we as the community, we as government, we as the, with the powers that be are starting to work together. And as I close, I want to say, I absolutely have no desire or any wish to be anything else. I am a woman. I just want to remain a woman because I bring life into this earth. All I'm asking is to recognize my worth because the future we can change and the world we should rearrange. I am a woman. Thank you. Always exciting and thank you for those very powerful words, Yvonne. I grew up with a nickname Yvonne Chaka Chaka because people thought uh, I looked like you and danced a lot like you. So now that we've heard from uh, our panelists, it's your turn, uh, dear journalists, to ask your question and please remember to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we shall be able to answer your questions give us your name and give us uh, the news uh, agency that you represent and uh, Yvonne just to let you know that uh, Sophie has from SABC has followed you we shall have the first question from Sophie Mokwena and SABC please kindly go live with your question uh, thank you so much. I just want to check with Dr. Muyeti. Dr. Muyeti when you look at um, the situation, particularly on the continent, uh, one year on uh, since South Africa reported the first COVID-19 case, the voice of a woman is not uh, prominent in terms of uh, solutions and suggestions on what needs to be done to address the pandemic on issues of research, but also access to vaccine, there is still no information whether pregnant women can um, take the vaccine and all of that. What is the World Health Organization doing to support women who are in research and science to come up with solutions and also address the health challenges facing women in terms of uh, also ensuring access to uh, to vaccine okay. okay thank you sophie dr Moet okay um, sure thank you very much sophie for that um uh, that question and condolences uh, on the loss of your colleague that uh, Yvonne told us about at the, at the start of this of this press conference. Uh, first of all, I you know talking about the the health challenges of women and what WHO is doing, we we work a lot as far as um, particularly healthcare workers, 
the majority of whom in our region are, are nurses. I am very much part of the movement around uh, showcasing and highlighting the leadership, the contribution of women who are nurses in providing care at the primary level, right up to being part of the leaders in health in uh, the public health systems in, in the African region. And a lot of the work that we do now in relation to, for example, infection prevention and control has been around uh, training, enabling people, healthcare workers, particularly nurses, to protect themselves at the workplace and ensuring that we highlight their contribution and then see that that is um, that is. Uh, given its proper place in terms of their appreciation of the role and contribution of women to the response to the pandemic. With regard to pregnant women, uh, WHO's guidelines uh, indicate that there is no contraindication to pregnant women receiving the vaccine. So our uh, advice is that uh, pregnant women can be vaccinated against uh, COVID-19. And then finally, in terms of research, yes, indeed, I think we have to acknowledge overall that uh, financing for research is a challenge in African countries uh, by African governments. Most of the research done is carried out in uh, four or five countries and mainly financed uh, internationally in the, in the rest of the region. We have, um, as WHO, an advisory group a senior level advisory group on uh, on research on which there are some women members. And our work is to promote uh, financing for research, promote uh, collaboration between governments and uh, researchers, mainly in academic institutions. And there we make an effort to identify women researchers uh, uh, to, be, to be engaged in research. I, I think you are correct that we could do better as we engender, as, as our sister, Madam Sa suggested our work in WHO to particularly target women uh, researchers. We made a lot of effort in WHO to target women workers, to bring in women into our organization. We're seeing some change there and we will expand this work to cover our influence over policies in countries in terms of who gets selected, who gets funded, and make sure that women have a fair chance at that as well. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Maweti. Madam Sao, oh, this is your area of work. I would like you to also weigh in into this. Uh, how, what is the UN Women doing to fill such a gap? Uh, thank you so much. I think, you know, our, our gender agenda is about rights, representation and resources. I say that because 2020, actually, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, it was really a highlight year, a very important year for us. For some of them, for, for some of the people who are online, you will remember that, uh, you know, 25 years ago, 45,000 women met in Beijing, China, uh, and came out with a very uh, platform of action called the Beijing Platform for, for, for Action. Uh, Hillary Clinton made a very famous speech, women's rights are human's rights. And last year, we were celebrating the 25 years of the Beijing Platform for Action showing that we had some gains uh, in terms of you know, primary school education, in terms of maternal mortality, uh, but we have a long way to go. And I will start with representation. Uh, apart from South Africa, Namibia, Rwanda, and Senegal, and other countries, very few countries in Africa have a parity uh, in their parliament. So representation is extremely important for us because where the decisions are being made that affect us, us who are half of the population, we are not represented. So making sure that women leadership, which is the theme of uh, women's, uh, International Women's Day, is at the center of what we do. Representation at all levels, in this health, in education, in media, because we know that we are able to amplify our voices. That number one. 2020 was also the 10 years uh, of UN Women. As you know, uh, UN Women was, uh, was uh, founded by civil society organizations, Strong Ask, and the Secretary General of the United Nations decided to make it an agency, an agency that is focused on gender equality and women empowerment, making sure that we move the needle on political representation, on ending violence against women. Because if you recall, on the 6th of April, the Secretary General made a call 
for a ceasefire on domestic violence because we saw that the during the, the pandemic when when restrictions of movement were, were implemented by a lot of countries women were at the the epicenter of the domestic violence blocked with the the, the partners who are in all countries whether it was europe or, or, or africa for once we were able to find examples worldwide to demonstrate that the advocacy that we have been doing on on ending gender based violence is is critical and in the region that i cover the sahel the studies show that during this period of school being closed girls were being married uh, harmful traditional practices such as uh, female genital mutilation were happening so we know that the, there's a shadow pandemic as uh, pumzile our ed calls it happening right now that we need to address we also need to address the issue of economic empowerment women are tired of microfinance we are tired of stockfell women that we spoke to through our our studies are saying there's nothing micro about us we are looking for patient capital credit lines guarantee funds that will really help us leapfrog i'll i'll end by talking about the workforce and uh, the gender pay gap uh, research also shows that it's going to take us 170 years to 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 close the gender pay gap we think it's unacceptable and the message that un women is giving to the world is that the covid-19 pandemic give us an opportunity to build back better and how do we build back better is that when we look at recovery how do we make sure that that recovery is fair and brings about social justice wow very powerful and indeed every time a woman speaks we can hear the passion with which it comes and i would want to reassure you uh, madam sar and uh, yvonne chaka chaka that dr moweti in the african region is doing an excellent job in promoting uh, women in especially in the health sector and uh, last year 8th of march launched uh, an event and, and an initiative to recruit 100 uh, UNVs into the World Health Organization African region. So this was such a, a big uh, climb for us. So now, given the period that we are in, which still goes back to COVID and uh, the COVID vaccine in this particular moment, we now have uh, questions that are sticking out still for, for vaccines, and I'll do mix this with uh, women questions that we are still getting. So we have our first question from uh, Voice of America, Columbus Mavunga. And the first question goes to you, Dr. Moeti. And it's, is the WHO happy with the rate at which African countries are rolling out their COVID-19 vaccine programs? And the same uh, journalist asks a question, which I'll give to you, Dr. Mihigo, who is our backup here today, and also help us answer some of these vaccine questions uh, that says, given the fragility of most African countries, given the fragility of most African countries' economies, will they be able to import adequate uh, COVID-19 vaccines rather than just depend on donations? Uh, that's for you, uh, Dr. Mihigo. The first one will go to Dr. Moeti. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, of course, we're very pleased, as I said in my statement, that finally um, African countries have started to receive um, supplies of vaccine. And as I said, we expect now that um, about uh, 10 or so countries, 11 countries have, have received their vaccines in the last few days and more and more will be doing so, including today in the next few weeks that uh, by the end of March, African countries will be starting their operations to roll out the vaccine. So that is a very positive step forward. It's something that has taken a lot of work, uh, collaborative work in this um, multilateral platform called COVAX, which is coordinated by WHO, Gavi, and uh, CEPI, and to which we, in which we have the partnership between countries at different levels of, uh, of income and revenue, including many low and low middle income countries, uh, quite a few African countries, and some upper income countries that have contributed some financing to work together, pool resources, create a market, go looking together for, for vaccine supplies. Of course, we would like the situation 
to be slightly different than it is in terms of access to vaccines. So even if some money is there and this uh, platform still has some gaps in the financing that is needed to actually reach the levels of, of coverage of, of vaccine that we are, we are desiring, uh, we would like the situation to be fairer in terms of access to vaccine supplies. And we are seeing that the targets and ambitions to cover whole populations still vary greatly between wealthy countries and uh, low-income countries, many of whom are partners in the COVAX facility. But we are pleased that the work has started. Our job now is to work with partners to support the countries to make the best use of the vaccine supplies that they are getting, starting with the most vulnerable groups and starting also with, with healthcare workers. And we hope that the manufacturing capacity of the, the pharmaceutical companies that have developed vaccines will increase so that our ambition of reaching 20% can be seen to go higher as, as, as uh, pharmaceutical companies invest much more in the production capacity and more and more vaccine supplies are available. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Dr. Mihigo, uh, with the fragility of our economies. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Tuebwe. Yeah, we, with this question, I think um, uh, the COVAX facility itself, um, when it was set up, it was meant exactly to um, support mainly low-income countries to address the issue of uh, equitable access to, to, to vaccines. So, uh, indeed, many countries are struggling to, you know, to, to put forward resources or additional resources to get vaccine. And I believe this is uh, what uh, COVAX facility is, is trying to help. Um, as you know, most of the vaccines that are currently being donated through the COVAX facility are free of, of charge. So when it comes to importing additional doses of vaccine, um, there are different avenues that a country could take, uh, either to, 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 to use the uh, African Union platform, uh, which also it's a pool kind of uh, uh, approach to, to get vaccine access, but we would like to um, very much as much country uh, to discourage country to go on the bilateral uh, deals uh, perspective, because this is where it become quite very complicated. It become uh, country getting very high price. So there is even within the COVAX facility a possibility to uh, access vaccine beyond the 20% through the same uh, costs uh, that uh, uh, COVAX facility is getting its, its vaccine. So we will encourage country first to take advantage of the doses being uh, provided through COVAX. Secondly, if they want to go beyond to use the pool mechanism that has been put in place, either through the African Union platform or to take that beyond their uh, uh, vaccine allocation within the uh, uh, COVAX facility. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mehigo. And I hope you realize that you're a special guest today as, as the man amidst uh, uh, women. So now I'll go to Sarah Jerving next from DevEx. Kindly go live with your question. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, does WHO have a goal in terms of what percentage of positive COVID-19 samples that African uh, countries should aspire to perform uh, genomic sequencing on? Um, and can you also comment on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on HPV screenings and cervical cancer cases? Okay, thank you very much. I'll as, ask you, Dr. Ngoi, to, re, to respond to the first question on the genome sequencing and if we have any uh, updates on that and if we have a goal as WHO. Thank you, Fiona. Please, can you uh, repeat the question, please? I didn't get it. Sarah, would you like to repeat your question? Sure. Um, so does WHO have a goal in terms of what percentage of positive COVID-19 samples that African countries should perform genomic sequencing on? Like, would it be 5% of uh, positive samples, 10%? And kind of what, on average, what are, uh, what is the percentage that uh, African nations are currently performing genomic sequencing? <laughs> No, thank you very much. Thank you for, for uh, we clearly we don't have a, a target in terms of percentage of the sample that need to be to be um, uh, sequenced on 
Uh, this is just for the simple reason that sequencing is actually done in relation to uh, surveillance. When I mean by surveillance is related to the pattern of the pandemic that we are seeing in a country. In a country. That's why we advise the country to do sequencing or not. Otherwise, uh, what we call routine surveillance uh, is, uh, is, is only done for specific diseases like uh, 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 influenza. But for the, the, the COVID-19, we are conducting, our aim is going to be able to conduct sequencing in all countries because the genomic surveillance will help us to determine whether there are new variant in those countries or the new variant are circulating or the already known variant are circulating in other countries. But in terms of percentage of the sample that we have, uh, that we need to reach, we don't have a kind, that kind of, of, of target, but we have the percentage out of the samples that need to be, to be selected from a, a cluster of cases or a cluster of, uh, of cases in, in a country, but not a target as such. Thank you, Dr. Ngoi, our expert who is now uh, managing uh, the, the team that is leading the COVID response in the African region. Uh, there was a question on the impact of HPV screen of the pandemic on HPV screening. Dr. Mihigo, would you want to quickly go over that? Okay, thank you, um, Fiona. Let me first, uh, on your last comment, acknowledge my participation in this uh, powerful uh, panel of women. I think uh, uh, this is uh, really unique, and thanks to Dr. Moet for bringing such a wonderful panel together. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, Fiona, we, we don't have uh, specific uh, data on HPV screening, but um, uh, in terms of um, overall uh, following up um, the uh, uh, continuity of health services, uh, clearly we are doing some um, regular uh, assessment in the country to try to understand how preventive measure in particular being a routine vaccination, but also cervical cancer screening in terms of the broader NCD uh, management are being done. And as we have seen in the first part of the pandemic, uh, most of these preventive uh, uh, services were quite affected. But to which extent and uh, the scale of um, uh, reduction, I think uh, we will probably need to uh, collect additional data uh, to try to understand the uh, extent to which these services were affected. But uh, um, uh, we've just finalized a study on oral health services, where we have seen that from the first part of the year uh, during the pandemic, compared to the second part of the year, and that was before the second wave, though the services were quite well, much affected in the first part, we saw a slight recovery um, uh, during the second part. We have now yet to analyze this type of trend, particularly with a screening for uh, a, a cervical cancer uh, related to, to, to that. So I think uh, this is well noted. We will definitely see how to gather uh, such data um, related to health uh, women. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mihigo. We have our next question going to you, Madam Sar, uh, from UN Women, and it's from Naftali Mwaura from Shinwa. And the question is, briefly describe the impact of COVID-19 on African women, given the fact that these have historically been marginalized in terms of access to health care and income generation. And then we shall have another one still from Naftali, and this goes to you, Yvonne. Do you think the pandemic has worsened gender disparity in the continent? Over to you, Madam Sarah. Uh, yes, thank you so much um, for, for that. Yes, my answer is yes. Uh, the women are at the epicenter of the pandemic. And I want journalists to leave this conversation knowing that the COVID-19 pandemic is not gender neutral. Uh, whether you're talking about the health sector, Dr. Moeti has mentioned, uh, where 70% of the, the, you know, the health workers and you know, the, 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 the support staff is essentially women. It shows you that in 2020, when they were saying women of the, women of the year, the poster child or the poster picture of that was women. You will also recall that um, our economies have a large component, uh, some say 70, 60% of the informal sector uh, you know, in Africa. And that informal sector is dominated by women. 
So you can imagine the drastic consequences and the impact on their revenue, uh, which they go and find daily on the markets, um, have been affected by the COVID. Uh, but I also want to highlight, maybe now that I have the floor, that the women were also part of the solution. And I'll share a few examples from my region. Uh, in Nigeria, some women who were seamstresses saw that there was a gap on the market in terms of masks. Everybody was competing for masks. If you remember, even some airplanes with masks were, were hijacked in Europe, you know, sold to the highest bidder. And I think a lot of economies and a lot of women reinvented themselves and started doing reusable masks. And I, there's actually a, a, quite an interesting report uh, from BBC on Africa on a designer called Folake. Her brand is called Tiffany Amber. And she was able to turn around her manufacturing business and start doing protective equipment and masks for hospitals, for, for hospital workers, bed sheets, you name it. So women are very resilient and they were able to reinvent themselves. The second example I want to share on economic empowerment uh, happened where we, we realized in Senegal that the food distribution, which also happened in, in many countries in Africa, the products that were being distributed were mostly imported, um, whether it was rice, whether it was sugar uh, and things like that. And I think one of the, the initiatives that I felt was very powerful and was replicated in other countries was how do we make sure that those food items that were being distributed were procured uh, from women-owned businesses. So we should take the, 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 the pandemic as an opportunity to do what we call women affirmative procurement. Uh, how do we make sure that the rice that is being distributed is, is bought from women farmers and women cooperatives, uh, whether it's local cereals, so that really uh, this new trend of uh, you know, what we call the local sovereignty in drugs, in food, in everything else, uh, be really catalytic in bringing uh, about uh, women economic empowerment uh, in, in Africa. I think we have a huge opportunity that we need to grab. I think uh, there's definitely a gap and that's our role, all of us uh, as partners to link up, uh, to influence uh, you know, government. Uh, part of our work is, uh, is how do we use data, statistics, uh, food, so government can have what we call gender responsive budgeting. And they are able to tell us for every dollar that they spend, this is how much they spend on women and girls. Excellent, excellent. And to you now, uh, Yvonne, on uh, if you think the pandemic has worsened the gender disparity uh, in the region. Thank you, Fiona. I really think it really has. You know, we've seen women and girls, you know, uh, becoming extremely, uh, 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 becoming victims you know, because of the spike of the uh, domestic uh, violence that is there. And most of the people, more and more people are being pushed to poverty because of the pandemic. So women are really suffering and girls because of this. I mean, my two uh, colleagues, you know, Dr. Mweti and, 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 and Madame Olimata, they've spoken about um, the gender equality that needs to be there but women are the ones who are suffering most and girls. But we know that the pandemic, uh, you know, COVID-19, it, 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 it kills men and women, but women are the ones who suffer the most because they've always been disenfranchised and segregated. And now with the pandemic, that really shows. And we see more of these women being stuck at home with those that are supposed to be protecting them and giving them the money and they get abused. So this really has become something that is a real pandemic and we have to really take one step further and make sure that we nip it in the bud. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so now we go to you, um, Lisa Schleng from um, Reuters, kindly, from Voice of America. Kindly go ahead with your question. Lisa, please go live with your question. Okay, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moiti and pa panelists, good morning. I have a couple of questions. The first is, I wonder whether uh, an analysis has been done, whether there are any sort of statistics regarding uh, how women are disadvantaged by the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of illnesses and deaths, whether uh, women are more uh, vulnerable to the disease itself. Um, also, um, in terms of uh, the kind of care that uh, women get uh, uh, versus that of men and the, well, the employment situation has been discussed to a sense. But I'm also wondering whether because of the uh, lockdowns, whether women are pushed into so-called negative coping mechanisms, uh, forced to uh, uh, well, sexual, do sexual work, prostitution, and so forth. And then a quick question on vaccinations, distributions. I was wondering whether there is any kind of a pecking order in terms of which countries get the vaccina vaccines first, uh, um, whether they, and, and how the quantity is also distributed. Uh, I'm not clear on whether countries have to pay a certain amount of money for the vaccines or not. And uh, how long do you think it will take for a significant part of the population on the continent to be vaccinated, given the uh, amount of time it's taking for the vaccines to arrive? Thank you. Wow, that's quite a uh, package. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Moeti to share these uh, questions uh, with uh, Madame Sa. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so first of all, the, the, the impact on, um, on women and in, in terms of uh, access to health services. Of course, there has been uh, an observed um, impact on women. We do have some data. Uh, but not very comprehensive data on what has happened in terms of gaps in services, drops in levels of coverage and access uh, compared to pre-COVID uh, COVID times. So, for example, we, we have uh, data from Ethiopia uh, showing uh, that there's been something like a 10% reduction in sexual reproductive health services, and that this could result in, now if you are projecting, quite a large number of women, about 48 million women with unmet needs for modern contraception and more than 15 million uh, additional unintended pregnancies. Early on in the, in the pandemic, we observed um, in, in Zimbabwe, for example, that um, there had been something like um, a 70%, if I recall the figure, reduction in access to contraceptions in the first quarter of the year compared to the year before. For women, so again, this will lead to unplanned pregnancies and uh, and other problems. In addition to that, uh, as, as part of the disruption in health services, there was a 42% drop in cesarean sections in Zimbabwe between January and April uh, last year, compared to the same period in 2020. And there's been also a, a reduction in women delivering in healthcare facilities with a skilled uh, midwife or a skilled assistant for, for the delivery. So there certainly have been uh, reductions in access to critical services, uh, particularly, I mean, for all people, let's be fair, but uh, particularly as far as, especially sexual and reproductive health services, which are vital for women, um, that, that, that has been uh, a problem, which means if I can now speak about building back better, that when we are designing or improving what we call the resilience of health services going into the future, this type of uh, learning observation needs to be taken into account in terms of what you plan into your service when there is an emergency. So it's not only to plan for ensuring that you can deliver immunization services for children, which is vitally important, but you bring in this gender lens, you look at those people who are able to pay for services because uh, in some of our countries we don't have health insurance and the people who are then worst affected are women and you make sure that you take particular care around uh, sexual and reproductive health services, young women's access to services to ensure that uh, we, we keep that 
in, in mind in, in terms of uh, equity, considering the particular vulnerability of women and making sure that it's planned in, it's anticipated, it is funded, and, and therefore the services can be, can be delivered. Uh, the question about the pecking order of um, the delivery or access to vaccines, the, the, the COVAX facility is very strong and central principle is around equity. So it is designed in such a way that countries are provided with vaccine supplies so that they were, they cover the same proportions of their population, in some senses, sharing the challenge of the shortages of vaccines. So this is what has been is being done now. Countries, in terms of allocations, uh, the, the COVAX facility ensures that what is available is distributed and divided up among countries so that if it's uh, because the, the initial deliveries now were aimed at covering 3%, they are going to be covering something like 2.6%. And it has been calculated to ensure that all countries are able to cover the same proportion of their population at the same time with successive rounds. So again, emphasizing very strongly the that principle of uh, of equity. How long is it going to be for significant proportions of uh, African uh, populations to be covered? At least the target, as far as the COVAX facility is concerned, is to have covered uh, 3% of the population at the beginning and to cover 20% of the population um, by the end of, of, of this year. We are very pleased that uh, the African Union, uh, working through its uh, acquisition, vaccine acquisition task team, has targeted ensuring that by the end of the year, sufficient vaccine has been procured and available to countries to cover 60% of the population. As I said before, the, the COVAX uh, targets were based on certain assumptions about manufacturing capacities and Av availability of financing to, to the facility. So it is a beginning in terms of the 20% that is targeted. Our hope and expectation from the discussions ongoing is that there is a lot of work going to try to expand the capacity to manufacture. The COVAX facility will be looking at uh, adding to the resources that are available so that we reach a level of coverage in African countries that can not only reduce severe illness and deaths, but also start to have an impact on slowing down the spread of the pandemic, uh, the so-called um, herd immunity. Oh, yes, thank you. So, Madam Sarah, I'll ask you to Wayne. Yes, um, you know, I, we all agree that if we want to move the needle, if we want uh, policymakers uh, to take us seriously and influence uh, you know, the, the policies that are being implemented, we need information. Uh, the journalists that are looking for information, I will recommend to visit two um, that you can find on, on Google, actually, two, two platforms. One is called uh, the COVID-19 uh, Global Gender Tracker uh, that was implemented by UN Women and UNDP. If you Google it, you will find it. And it looks at 46 countries on, on, the, on the continent, and the number of measures that have been uh, put in place to respond to COVID and really look at the nexus between, uh, you know, violence, uh, economic uh, issues and unpaid care with all the list of countries with the measures that they've taken and some who are, that are gender sensitive. Very, very um, important tool even for, for you as a journalist if you're looking for up-to-date data that you want to quote. Uh, it's, it's available in there. And you will see that 56% of all the measures have to do uh, with, uh, with ending violence against women, whether it's issues of policy, of skills, of services. Uh, of work. And so we're going to come out of that World Health Organization Africa panel discussing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women on the continent. Uh, they did honor the late broadcaster and journalist Karima Brown, uh, saying that she had done great journalistic work in her time. They talked about uh, the issues of livelihoods, particularly for women who work in the informal sector, how they've been impacted, the twin pandemic of uh, gender-based violence that has also grown uh, as a result of the pandemic 
pandemic with people being at home and so on and so forth. Female school children not being able to spend as much time at school as we would want. Um, and they basically talked about how governments really need to invest more in women. Uh, UN women uh, basically saying that uh, women are tired of uh, getting micro loans and uh, doing stock fells. They want serious money to have access to serious money so that they can elevate uh, their lives and those of their families. Women are at the center of families at the end of the day and society.